Crispin here today, one chilly morning with another workshop video. Today I'm going to focus on these slots. You might remember from my frames video that I cut three slots like these down the length and in this video I'm going to explain the purpose of them and show the next steps. Here is the general arrangement of the frames and the axle. One frame on this side, one about four and a half inches uh, away on the other side and the axles run between these slots like this and obviously on each end of the axle you have a wheel. Okay so to explain how that's actually going to work I'll need to introduce you to a few bits. Half of the story are these split uh, journal bearings and the other piece of the jigsaw puzzle are these and I uh, I hadn't started doing video taping when I made these but I did take pictures and so I'll take a moment now to explain how I made these the first thing to say is that those bits I've just shown the uh, fabricated bits are normally bought as castings however I decided to fabricate them out of bits of steel I had lying around. This picture shows uh, the six back plates I made. That's uh, hot rolled steel and I cut those shapes out with a little angle grinder and a cutting disc. Once I'd done that I laid the six uh, pieces on top of each other and sandwiched them up in the milling machine and cut the outer profile. Um, the two acute angles both had a three quarter inch radius filed on them as well at this stage. Um, the next job was to cut a uh, rectangle out of the middle and um, so I chain drilled that just using the uh, increments on the hand wheels to move the thickness of the drill along each time. Um, and as you can see I've also got four bolts in there that are holding everything together now that um, the vice isn't doing so. So once I've got my chain drilling pattern I drilled those on the drilling machine and you can see uh, where all the drills have um, broken through, all the drilled holes have broken through and released that uh, slug that's now on the right. Uh, I then milled and filed the inner rectangle up so that was to size and put the rest of the holes in as you can see around the edge there's uh, 18 holes in total. There's the six bits. The next thing to do was to make a horseshoe shape that will fit in the middle of that radio, uh, middle of that rectangle and that's just made out of uh, three bits of flat bar. Uh, I then cleaned the edges up so I had one nice uh, continuous rectangle and uh, I then fitted the back plates together or back plates and uh, horseshoes together with a, a nice small gap uh, ready for silver soldering. The next thing I would need is a number of uh, smaller bits of steel to produce the webs that went all the way around the edge. So I just got uh, little stacks of uh, bits of uh, mild steel and milled a 90 degree uh, corner on them. The other two edges would be cut off at a later time so I just wanted the corner. There's all the bits ready to go. I've got six back plates, six uh, horseshoes and a number of little bits that will be silver soldered on for the webs. I had to think of a way of um, holding everything together while it was silver soldered because you really can't be touching the bits uh, while you're silver soldering them unlike welding uh, where I could have tacked them in place uh, with silver soldering you really have to have everything held in the right place for the duration so I uh, made a particularly crude uh, jig out of a piece of copper pipe as shown here and uh, it's just bent into a square and then I filed slots in it to hold all the bits in the right position and um, 
and it worked very well in the end despite its appearance. There we are heating it up, ready for silver soldering. And it was quite a difficult silver soldering job really because the, uh, there's an awful lot of joints to get round and everything was uh, at the right temperature at the same time. And it doesn't take too long before the flux starts burning away and um, the solder stops running. Once I had them all silver soldered up, I machined the top surface down to thickness. Then I flipped it over and sat it on some parallels and machined the bottom surface to the overall right thickness. So now I had um, the right thicknesses, all that was left was to cut those webs down. I did that with a hacksaw and then uh, finished them off with a linisher and then I grit blasted the whole thing. And here it is, as you saw a minute ago, there's a finished one. They call them horn blocks. Why uh, that's their name, I'm not sure, but that's what they're called on the drawing. Right, so now that you're familiar with the bits, I'm going to show how it should fit together. Once I've radiused these corners, this should fit nicely into here and then it can be riveted on through these holes. When I rivet these on, they're likely to move slightly. So uh, I've left plenty of metal on, so once they're riveted up, I can then machine these faces to accept this. And that should be able to slide up and down, and it'll be sprung in the end, and that will provide my suspension system. So to fit these, a bit of filing is required. And uh, I just want a nice sliding fit. I, I can then use these holes and this plate as a template to drill into this frame. Then, once I've done that, I can proceed to rivet it together. For marking out purposes, I like to just put a layer of dye on. And then I'll use a radius gauge to mark out the... Uh, or give me a guideline of what I need to file to. Remember, for a radius, a rocking motion, helps prevent flat spots ending up on the curve. Let's check this for a fit. Okay, so checking with my two thou feeler gauge, there's a bit more to go. And by sight, it's off this one. Okay, I think that's got it. can't get my feeler gauge in along the top really, so uh, I can move on to drilling now. Time to rivet these on now. I've got all my holes in and this slots in nicely. Uh, the rivets I'm going to be using are these. They're, uh, I believe them to be soft iron. The heads are going to be on this side and they're going to be poked through like that. And then if you look at the reverse, I've countersunk the backs and uh, so once everything's in position, I will hammer this end over until it fills the countersink. Uh, once that happens, uh, and they're all done, I can uh, level off the back, probably on a linisher. Typically, riveting is done using a rivet snap. Here's an example of one. And 
on the end we've got a, a dish that can support the bottom of the rivet so this would be in a vise and the rivet would sit in it like that while you hammered on the other end and if you wanted a, a um, dome on the other side so a, a dome on the bottom and a dome on the top you'd use a pair of these and support one end um, with the rivet snap in the vise and you'd use an identical rivet snap on the top to form the dome the other purpose these serve is to seat all the layers together so if you've got say two layers of metal and a rivet you can poke the rivet through the two layers as you'll see me do in a minute and then put the end in the hole and give it a wallop and that will seat um, the two layers of metal and the rivet head all together before you uh, start closing it over. So let's take a look at the riveting. Uh, one thing to mention is to get into all these spaces to support the rivet from this end say down in this corner I'm going to need to make a special rivet snap so I'll do that now and show you that first. Here is the tool I've made just a, a dished end and a slightly reduced diameter and this is a piece of carbon steel or silver steel so I'm going to temper it uh, as if it were an impact tool and then we should be ready to go. What I did there was to heat it to a cherry red, then quench the very tip and then lift it out of the water until the area I want to, the business end if you like, turned uh, to a plum blue and I quenched it out fully. To demonstrate, a file now just glides over it waiting till it got the blue by the way before fully quenching it was to give it some impact resistance so here's our custom rivet snap and i've left it long enough so that the bottom of it is touching the bottom of the vise check our bit goes on and in goes the first rivet And uh, I've got my drilling machine table over there which can support the end of it. Let me line that up there. The first thing to do, as I mentioned, is to seat the uh, rivet using the hole. And then I'll start by just using the flat end of this hammer to take the rivet down a bit. OK, now I'll use the uh, dome end to fill the countersink. And that's all there is to it. Next rivet in. The hardest bit is trying not to miss because if you miss with the domed end it puts a ding in the surface that's unhideable.
full size rivets would be put in hot and that way um, as they cool they contract and pull even pull the pieces of metal even tighter together. In goes today's 100th rivet. And there's 102 in total, so nearly there. It's a good job I had sausages and bacon for breakfast. I need the energy. And that concludes that. That's uh, all six horn blocks riveted on now. And uh, you might be able to see down here, maybe, that um, I can just smooth those off now. So I'll do that in a second. Get the uh, rivet snap out of the vise. I'm pleased with the tempering. It's, it's uh, held its form very well. And there we have it. Looks a little bit ugly with um, some of the high spots being taken off, but it's nice and smooth now and it'll paint up nicely in the end. There's a view of the other one from this side. So I hope you've enjoyed the video. I'm pleased with the outcome. And uh, the next video on the way will be um, machining these insides to accept those axle boxes I showed earlier, the split journal bearings, and making a plate up for the bottom. So uh, thanks for watching. See you on the next video.